Loch Ness, an enigmatic region nestled within the Scottish Highlands, boasts the largest volume of fresh water in Great Britain. Its inky depths plunge to nearly 800 feet, extending over 23 miles. Here, in this ancient abyss, a legend has endured for centuries. A legend known as the Loch Ness Monster. While I was out fishing, it was really the month of March, the middle of March, and I was coming up past this spot here, when I noticed some branches in the loch, and I found them outside line. So I tried to guide the boat so the line would miss the branch, and when I looked out watching my line, I thought just saw this huge object out between the waves, going against the wind. And I knew right away it was uh, something very much alive. We saw it, the head, and the four humps, and all the body. Can you tell me anything about its color? Yes, it was the very same color as an elephant. It had a small head, like a needle or a snake, magnified about 10, 15, 20 times. In the distance, it was difficult to see. The best view I ever had was the very first, in 1934. I saw the head, the neck, and the huge body, which I'd say was about 30 feet long. After thousands of years of research and speculation, the question still lingers like the mist on the water's surface. Does the Loch Ness Monster really exist? Sightings of Nessie typically depict the entity as sizable and green, featuring a pointed head and an extended neck emerging from the water's surface. This imagery often evokes comparisons to a serpent-like being. One theory states that it could be remanent from the era of dinosaurs, possibly resembling a creature like the plesiosaur, which lived during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods spanning a staggering 65 to 200 million years ago. A famous enigma is connected to the ancient culture of the Picts. Among the carvings that adorn the stones in this region, one peculiar figure stands out. An entity with an elongated beak, a distinctive head, and flipper-like appendages. Researchers have often compared this creature to a swimming elephant, as it represents the earliest evidence of the notion that Loch Ness harbors a mysterious aquatic being. On the evening in question, without doubt, a shape like the prow of a Norwegian fishing vessel as sticking right out of the water. It had a small head, like a needle or a snake, magnified about 10, 15, 20 times. In the distance, it was difficult to see. It stood erect out of the water and sailed right into our view. In the dying sunlight, as you know from the loch here, uh, it traveled right across our field of vision in the direction of doors. It sank twice into the water in that three or four minutes. We then thought we had lost it. It came up again and sailed further towards doors, seemed as if it was getting into shallow water, turned, got into the center loch, and then for the first time, it went at full speed ahead with uh, a wave and a wash right up the center loch and away from our view. The earliest written record of a monstrous presence within these waters dates to the seventh century, chronicled in the biography of St. Columba, the Irish missionary who brought Christianity to Scotland. In AD 565, St. Columba, 
on a mission to visit the northern Pictish king, was drawn to the shores of Loch Ness. He claimed that he saw a monster uh, chasing towards a swimmer, and he, he put his arm up and with a cross said, go no further, do not touch this man. That is written in history by St. Adamon, the narrator for St. Columba. The monstrous entity receded into the depths, never to harm another soul. It's tempting to link this account with the Loch Ness Monster, but some consider that this narrative may describe a walrus, a notion that can relate to the recent walrus sightings in northern Scotland. Nevertheless, skeptics argue that even individuals unfamiliar with walruses would likely describe the creature in terms of more recognizable animals, as St. Columba did. Certainly we should always look at any report, be it a water monster, be it a UFO, be it a ghost. People have to look through prehistory and draw their own conclusions as to what people of that time were saying. Scotland is a mythical country and there was a lot of creatures allegedly, you know, traversing the, the lochs and traversing the moorlands and stuff like that. A lot of it's mythology, but maybe some of it's not. Maybe some of it could be real. You know, we're dealing with real bona fide sightings because let us not forget, there's also a monster in Loch Mora, which is to the west of Scotland. And we did research there with our society back in 1990. Loch Mora is only 11 miles long, but it's, I think it's the third deepest loch in, in Britain. And it's another freshwater lake. And again, people have claimed to have seen something like a, a snake-like head, a small sheep head, and this upturned boat shape m moving up on the, the surface of the water. When General Wade's military road was extended uh, at one of the sides of Loch Ness, they opened up Victorian ladies and gentlemen to come up to the Scottish Highlands to have a look at uh, the beautiful Scottish scenery. And whilst they were there, there were some Nessie reports as well. So the gentry from England came up and it just made a name for Loch Ness at that time. So there was a number of sightings generated by people who now had the access to come to Scotland through the, the rail networks and also General Wade's military road. Well, I was out fishing. It was really the month of March, middle of March. And I was coming up past this spot here when I noticed some branches in the loch and I found them outside line. So I tried to guide the boat so that the line would miss the branch. And when I looked out watching my line, I thought just saw this huge object out between the waves going against the wind. And I knew right away it was uh, something very much alive. So I watched it, and I noticed quite close, a matter of 30 yards from it, I could even describe the colour of the skin. The skin was a sort of a dark brown, very, very rough, scaly. And up towards the shoulder, what I took to be the shoulder, the way it was going against the wind, was this, what I took to be a mane. But it could be, it could be a flipper, it could be a fin or anything. How long was the object you saw? I would say 14 to 15 feet long. Pretty big? Pretty big, yes, pretty wide. I would say roughly four feet in width, you know, across the, across the back. You didn't see any sign of a head? No head, no head or no tail, none whatsoever. Were you in any doubt that this was the monster? Oh, no, no, none whatsoever, none whatsoever, because whatever it was, it was very, very much alive. You would see the spray coming off as the shoulder of the the monster was hitting the wave, going against the wind. Quite a big spree. You've lived on this loch for 65 years. This is the first time I've you saw it? I've fished the loch, I would say, 45 years, every season. And I've seen things away at a distance. Could be anything, could be barrels, could be floating logs, but I would never say it was a monster because I wasn't sure. But this particular time, there was no doubt whatsoever, none whatsoever. How do you feel about telling people you've seen the monster? Do people believe you? Well, I don't care to believe me or not, because I saw it, I've satisfied myself, I tell them what I've seen. If they don't, they're entitled to their own opinion, but I hope someday they will see it. And they'll be the same opinion as me. How do you I, feel about coming fishing on the lock now? Well, I'll be truthful to you, I used to fish in the lock quite well every year, and I, I never thought of, it never gave me a thought to cross back and forth the lock half a dozen times a day. But now I don't cross so often. And when I leave one shore to go to the other, I always look back to see what, which of the shortest, the one I'm going to or the one I left, in case the dust come up beside me. 
Was it I'm, frightening? It was frightening, yes, for a freshwater lox. It's a huge creature to be in the water, oh, yes. It was the size of it that The size you. of it, yes, definitely, definitely. Yet the dawn of the modern Nessie legend arrived in 1933, when a newly constructed road offered unprecedented views of Loch Ness from the northern shore. A local couple's sighting, chronicled in the Inverness Courier, set the stage for a media frenzy that persists to this day. So basically what they claim they saw was again this upturned boat shape. But just they knew that they were looking at something bizarre. And the same with the other gentleman, there was a long neck and a small head as well. Again, consistent from the time, it's never really changed much even to present day. This is the main sightings that we're seeing on the surface of Loch Ness. Underwater is a different story. Quickly after, thousands of other people claim they have also seen or captured evidence of the creature. Again, possibly because Loch Ness was now open to the tourists and more and more people were coming to this rural, rural area of Scotland. They had this opportunity to go to the Trossachs, to the Highlands, and viewing all these wonderful attractions because Loch Ness had a paddle steamer on it at one time, you know, so you had tourists going up and down. And that opened up the, the whole situation for people to become more aware of these historical stories and pursue the, 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 the case of, is there truly something there? Maybe we might see it. You know, we're not spending all this time and money trying to prove that there's a large unidentified species in Loch Ness. We know that. We've seen it and we know it's here. What we are trying to do now is identify the species. Clem Lister of the Bureau for Investigating the Loch Ness Phenomena needs no convincing that there is a monster. He's not alone. St. Columba is said to have seen it in 568 AD. Latter-day visitors have been seeing it since 1933. So is it mollusk or reptile, animal, vegetable or mineral? Another man who has no doubts whatsoever is Hugh Ayton of Dawes near Inverness. He told me how he once chased Nessie in his boat. We saw it, the head and the four humps and all the body. Can you tell me anything about its colour? Yes, it was the very same colour as an elephant. Now, how did it dive? Or oh, straight down. Why do you think the monster went down? Was it frightened by the noise? Yes, of... the noise of the outboard. And then what did you do after that? Well, we came home again after that. We never seen it after that. Weren't you rather terrified being so close to it? No, not at the time, but I wouldn't do it again. 20 times altogether. And not only in the one spot, but in all different areas of Loch Ness. What's the most you've ever seen of it at any one sighting? The best view I ever had was the very first in 1934. I saw the head, the neck, and the huge body, which I'd say was about 30 feet long. And what's the closest you've ever been to it? Oh, within about uh, less than 10 yards. From 10 yards then, what does it really look like? Oh, well, the skin, the hump, the one big hump on the skin was exactly like that of an elephant. Wrinkly, tough looking. Is it not possible, Mr. Campbell, that you're mistaken in this, either because you're imagining things or more probable because you've been brought up to believe in this monster? Not at all. I'm thoroughly, I know perfectly well because I've seen it, and not only myself, but educated, far better educated people than I am. Since 1962, local experience has been backed up by scientific study. The Bureau for Investigating Loch Ness Phenomena keeps constant watch. Donations of £10,000 have kept it going. It's short of funds now, but not short of results. Clem Lister says he's seen Nessie five times. I think the most exciting occasion was the time I unfortunately saw it alone. I was, uh, I, my story's not corroborated at all. I was coming across the lock up in that direction over there, half past 12 a.m. I'd just run some soldiers over to our site on the other side of the lock. And uh, it was a flat calm, and I had a dinghy with an outboard, and the outboard packed up. And I started to row. I'd been rowing for about three minutes, and suddenly I heard this peculiar sound. It was going sort of something like that. And uh, I looked over my right shoulder, and there she was, about 
15 yards away from me. And I only looked at it very briefly because after that, I was only interested in putting as much distance between me and it as possible. So what particular species do you think it is? The evidence, as I interpret it, all fits, and I know this is a fantastic statement, but this all fits Plethiosaur. Now, as you know, Plethiosaur is one of the dinosaur families supposed to be extinct for 70 million years. Some experts say it's just rotting vegetable matter brought to the surface in an explosion of gases. But Ted Holliday, who claims one sighting, has other theories. In my opinion, and I've studied it fairly closely, I think that it's some form of mollusk. This is what? Um, the same uh, class of animal to which the octopus and the squid belong. But what evidence have you for saying that? Well, the witnesses are... Uh, most of them are repulsed when they get a very close sighting of it. They're horrified. Well, I'd be horrified if I saw a reptile out in the middle of the lock. Well, there are a lot of photographs been taken, allegedly, of Nessie over the years, and a lot of hoaxes as well. Um, some of the photographs I've seen over the years are, have this, this long tapering neck. I can't get away from it, I always say it. And that's been compelling. But it also asks and begs the question, could it not be an eel? Because eels have been seen in Loch Ness, otters have been seen, and seals have been seen in Loch Ness as well. There is an eel population in there, but can eels dive up out of the water like that has been captured in these photographs? Those photographs look compelling, um, but whether compelling of what is what we have to ask ourselves, of a, of a monster? Probably not, probably just of an eel. Dr. Robert Rines was uh, from the Academy of Applied Sciences in America, and he came over to hopefully prove once and for all if there was something in Loch Ness, real or not real. He was there, he was a man on the ground. He brought over the most sophisticated underwater technology, side scan sonar and uh, other types of sonar as well, was deployed into Loch Ness at Temple Pier at Castle Urquhart and uh, to find out if there were any evidence to suggest that there was something in Loch Ness. He came over in 75 and he came over a few years later and he did. He did manage to get some incredible photographs of what appears to be Nessie. Yes, the first, I think, was this terrible Rorschach test here, which uh, to our mind shows a body, a rough body with all kinds of highlights of the intense strobe light is reflecting uh, from it, and an appendage, that sort of diamond or rhombic shape uh, coming off of it with a center rib in here. Around 2,000 photographic frames were exposed and expeditiously sent to the United States for development under tightly controlled conditions. Three of these frames appeared to capture objects allegedly taken simultaneously with sonar contact. Initially, the main photograph that caused a massive stir worldwide was what's known as the flipper photograph, a diamond-shaped flipper with a heavy ridge in its center. It made a sensation throughout the world. Here, at last, was proof of a creature in Loch Ness. But when you look at the original photograph, the untouched photograph, it's just a blur. It's just a blur. Here again is the first flipper picture. As photographers, as photographers have to enhance it and photographically uh, touch it up in that sense in order to make it print. Uh, that's the first one. And then this was the second one, which seems to show a flipper in a different position. Well, here's the uh, original flipper picture we just discussed. And then about 45 seconds later, a second flipper picture, which seems to be either the same one or another one in a, in a different position. And the corroboration of taking two photographs is amazing. As if that isn't enough, at the same time, we got these sonar pictures 
uh, because we were exploring the same area uh, with sound waves, which gave further corroboration that indeed these were real parts of real moving animals in that lake. Obviously, it's been pixel separated enhancement to look like a flipper, and that caused a lot of debate, you know. And I think it's, to me, it's been doctored absolutely. By all, by all manner of means, yeah, by all means, tidy up a photograph, clarify the photograph, bring it up to the best you can, but don't doctor it to look like a flipper. I'm not convinced that that is a flipper at all, not a chance. Here is the most unusual film of recent years, for it proves the existence of a monster in nest. Climatic conditions and exposure day and night to bleak and stormy weather affected our film, which accounts for the misty results. But this is unimportant in comparison to the achievement of filming the monster itself for the first time in history. Over the years, there have been many attempts at Nessie hoaxes, but some evidence has never been disproved. This film was shot in April 1960. Detailed examination by reconnaissance experts suggested the object in it was a living creature. It was filmed by aero engineer Tim Dinsdale. Like a black anaconda, that's what it looked like. Came out of the water like that, and then it went down, and there was a boil of white foam. And then it broke surface once again with a boil and went on. I didn't see it again. Throughout Nessie's history, photographic evidence played a pivotal role. One image captured in 1934 features a slender neck emerging from the water's surface. Dr. Robert Kenneth Wilson, a London surgeon, found himself in the Scottish Highlands on a hunting expedition with his companion, Maurice Chambers. Wilson, intrigued by what he captured on undeveloped photographic plates, asked for the expertise of a local chemist in Inverness. To his surprise, the developed plates revealed an image that bore a striking resemblance to a sea creature sporting an elongated neck. The chemist suggested Wilson contact the London Daily Mail, a decision that would alter the course of Loch Ness history. Wilson chose not to disclose his identity, and thus the iconic image became known solely as the surgeon's photograph. Well, they're two different animals. The, I, I don't mean animals in the sense of, of, of what's in the lake. Uh, the, uh, the Wilson photograph, or the surgeon's uh, picture, pictures, by the way, there were two, uh, created quite a, a stir and apparently were quite consistent with what eyewitnesses had seen through the years. This photograph, however, turned out to be an act of revenge by Marmaduke Wetherill. The London Daily Mail had commissioned Wetherill to seek out the Loch Ness Monster. But when his reported discovery of intriguing footprints proved to be a hoax, the newspaper publicly humiliated him. In return, Wetherill planned to create a monster using a toy submarine, 35 centimeters in length, bought from a department store. Collaborating with his stepson, a sculptor, they put together a long-necked creature from putty and put it on top of the submarine so that its head and neck extended approximately 30 centimeters above the water's surface. Turns out it was not Wilson who snapped the photographs. Instead, it was Wetherill and his other son who orchestrated the scene. This elaborate trick became a key moment in the history of Loch Ness lore, casting a shadow of doubt and intrigue over the quest for the mysterious creature. For six decades, this image stood as a testament, even as skeptics speculated about driftwood, elephants, otters, or birds. In 1994, however, the truth unraveled, revealing the hoax. The surgeon photograph for me personally, obviously it's a hoax. We know that now, it's a bona fide hoax. But that's an iconic photograph of what I've been saying is the long slender neck of the sheep-like head. It was in all the books, all the magazines, all the TV shows, until it was unmasked as a hoax.
There was a, another photograph as well near uh, Castle Urquhart, uh, P. N. McNabb, I think it was. And uh, again, you've got a long hump and a smaller hump, and that's been revealed as a hoax as well. Um, and it, it causes a lot of problems because it's a fly in the ointment for people who's trying to do serious research at Loch Ness. And it kind of, people's attention then goes away, well, we knew that, there's nothing in Loch Ness, and they move away from it. Well, all the time they really want, you know, there is something there. The same applies to UFOs, you know, you get a lot of hoaxes and people move away from it. Years back, I, I used to refer to myself as um, a charlatan, a fake, a hoaxer, um, a liar even. But uh, this comes down to the Creighton paradox. If I'm telling you that I'm lying, how on earth could you possibly believe me? Another popular name in the history of the Loch Ness search is Doc Shields, a multifaceted artist whose name resonates with magic, surrealism, and a touch of the paranormal. He claimed that he captured two pictures of the Loch Ness monster. Hailing from Salford, the enigmatic artist known as Doc Shields boasts a diverse range of occupations, from magician and writer to busker, stage performer, surrealist, and psychic entertainer. Yet, some have ventured to add another descriptor, hoaxer. Doc Shields attracted considerable attention by thrusting into the public eye one of the most extraordinary images of Nessie. According to his account, the Doc stood at the base of Urquhart Castle when he purportedly spied the mysterious creature gliding through the water, capturing two photographs of a smooth, glossy beast with powerful muscles that remained visible for four to six seconds. Intriguingly, those present at the castle that day somehow failed to share in his remarkable sighting. Magic has always been concerned with changing things, with uh, shape-shifting images. Uh, reality is only, only half real. That's the surreal side to it, the, um, the dream world. You're asking me if I took an image of the surface of the water, then took it back, painted another image on that, a painted superimposed image, and then re-photographed it, or I forgot the bit where it was a, a very large piece of um, reversal film. No, I did not do that. What I did, what I actually did, to tell you the truth, is take a couple of photographs of the Loch Ness Monster. It's much easier doing it that way. If you have the real monster coming up, you don't need to bother with photographic fakery. The thing is to point the lens at the long-necked beastie that's coming out of the water. Then you don't have to bother doing with the brush strokes or all that technical stuff. You just photograph a monster, simple as that. Yeah, yeah, he's a character and, um, I mean, obviously, he's captured Nessie in full glorious colour. Uh, I think it was back in the 70s at uh, Castle Urquhart. He claims he was on the lock side and he was sending out thoughts for Nessie to appear, Nessie to appear, Nessie to appear. And then suddenly this creature rose up from the depths of Loch Ness again with a long ne neck and the head. And he got this marvellous photograph of it. Yes, he shows a, a neck coming up. Well, you know, he, he came there at the Loch Ness <clears throat> to get a picture of the monster. <laughs> and so obviously he got a picture of the monster, but he, he's a... A, uh, a, um, a showman. And yes, that does uh, reflect on us because if it were represented as a real picture and it turned out to be a, a, a hoax, you can see the headlines saying Loch Ness pictures are hoax and that means everybody's. So serious scientists have been afraid to come to Loch Ness because it's such an improbable story in the first place and they don't want to risk tarnishing their reputations because there are a lot of people who are, are hucksters. The old die transfer retoucher, the die transfer, you were able to strip and compose in camera a certain amount of elements. And when you started to blend them together to make them look all as one photograph, 
that the emulsion of the dye transfer would only allow you to work on it so much before it started to break up. Here you don't have that problem. You can work on this file over and over again, taking things in and out of it, and it'll never matter. And you could go back a year from now, pull this up off of a, a disk, read it back into the box, and start over again, adding new elements. Uh, the, the original film was analyzed by the Royal Photographic Society, by a, the fellow who was the president or ex-president at the time uh, um, of the Royal Photographic Society. Dr. Vernon Harrison, it was 200 ASA Actrochrome slide film. I shot the pictures with uh, a 135 telephoto lens from Urquhart Castle. I can't remember how I opened the aperture or shut it down at that time. But uh, yes, the original, the original role was analyzed. Say an animal upwards around 30 tons comes up out of the water, there has to be some kind of movement in the water. There has to be some kind of effect. Here, this neck is protruding, protruding straight out of the water with a shadow, but yet the water is undisturbed. Doesn't make any sense. People have suggested that I went out and photographed some water. It happened to be Loch Ness. Well, I didn't have to travel from Cornwall to, to that part of Scotland. And then I would just take a few photographs of, of water of the lock and then go home and do some kind of painted and sandwich job with the, um, the image I produced later, in theory, and uh, stick them, superimpose them on um, a few little ripples on the surface of the lock. Of course I didn't do that. I don't have the... Um, well, I don't have the technical skills to do that photographically. Well, I can paint and I can draw, but I paint and draw different things. And I photograph... If I'm photographing monsters, it had better be a monster there that I'm photographing. Otherwise, why waste my time? There's only three ways this could have been. Is it the photo was taken and the monster really existed, which is not possible, or if it was actually photorealistically illustrated in, or if another image was created and it was scanned in, and it was actually composed and blended to look like it belonged in this photo. If you were suggesting to me that I'd done the finest ever retouching, rephotographing job that anyone on the planet has ever done, I'd say, I wish I was that good, but if I want to take pictures of monsters, I just take pictures of monsters. On the back of the neck here, you could see indications of possible bleaching from a dye transfer. You could see areas of water going through the neck in these areas, mostly in the darker areas, because the dye would have been added on top of the, the darker areas onto the dye transfer. But in the lighter areas, it would have been bleached out with chemicals. So you wouldn't really see any of the original image going through it. But there is indication of it in the darker areas, clearly. I wish I knew the answer. I wish I could safely say to you that Tony Doc Shields truly did capture that photograph, because if he did, that would be one of the best photographs we have of Nessie ever. But I'm still 50-50 on that particular photograph, this beautiful colour photograph, which incidentally is not grey as the normal signs of Nessie, it's normally a grey creature, elephant grey skin. Tony Doc Shields captured a, a Nessie with a green tinge running down its neck, etc. And um, I'd like to believe it's true, but I, I, knowing Doc's reputation, etc., I'm reluctant to put any credence to that particular photograph.
Additionally, advancements in DNA analysis have been applied to Loch Ness. In 2019, scientists from New Zealand conducted a study by extracting environmental DNA from water samples. Their findings suggested the absence of large animals like plesiosaurs or sturgeons, which had been proposed as a potential explanation for Nessie sightings. Instead, they proposed that giant eels might be responsible for some of the reported sightings. Every single sampling site that we went to pretty much had eels. Um, and the sheer volume of it was a bit of a surprise. Now, is it possible that what people are seeing is a giant eel? Well, maybe. This skipper says he's had his own run-in with a monster. A blip on his boat sonar won him the prestigious Nessie Sighting of the Year prize. I believe that I've seen something strange in the lock, for sure, uh, on my sonar screen that day, eight years ago, was an object a metre to a metre and a half wide. Where could it go? It could dive into the lock. We've got 200 metres of water here, caves, little caverns, somewhere for a, a monster to hide. Ah, totally, yeah. yeah. Nessie's hiding. Nessie's hiding, yeah. Keeping the mystery alive is big business for Scotland, and the DNA results didn't put these tourists off the search. We came to find the monster, and, um, we did. you know, we did. <laughs> We've got a sighting here. It might be a giant eel. I don't think so. No? Eels don't have legs. No. If she's large and I can see her, what difference does it make? It's what's in your mind. These DNA results are using modern techniques to try and solve an ancient mystery. But Nessie's not dead in the water just yet. This loch is 24 miles long, well over 200 metres deep, and there are countless caves. So for those who want to believe, there is still room for the legend of this loch to live on. Tales of a giant creature lurking beneath the murky waves of Loch Ness have been around for over 1,500 years. But Professor Neil Gemmell hopes the marvels of modern science can finally lay the mystery to rest. Here we are at Loch Ness, just with Urquhart Castle behind us. We're going to be taking some water samples at a variety of depths using this device here. Neil has travelled over 18,000 miles from New Zealand to hunt for Loch Ness Monster DNA. From a half a litre of water, we can get a very, very good uh, catalogue of life within the loch. And we thought this would be a great place to showcase that technology because, of course, there's this hook of some, there may be something uh, unknown to science lurking in those waters. You know, most of the sightings are explainable uh, as either waves, boat wakes, logs that have submerged and then re-emerged. And I suspect that's what most people have seen, but, you know, there's over a thousand people who claim they've seen a monster. Those that have been searching Loch Ness for decades hope Neil will finally get to the bottom of this enduring mystery. I'm sure that um, some species will be found which have probably not been described. Now, they might be bacteria. In fact, they're more likely than anything else to be bacteria. Uh, if you did find something, and I do, I do emphasize the if, then you would actually get quite a good handle on what sort of a creature, what class of animal you were looking at, whether it's fish, flesh, or fowl. The last reported sighting of the Loch Ness Monster was in March 2018 by an American couple standing on the ramparts of the majestic ruin of Urquhart Castle. And tourists continue to come. These ongoing scientific searches continue to show the enduring fascination with Loch Ness and its cryptic inhabitant as researchers continue to explore the depths of this ancient Scottish lake. In the present day, Loch Ness exploration leads an unprecedented search for Nessie, employing state-of-the-art technology from thermal drones to hydrophones. Though understanding has evolved, the quest to demystify the legend endures. 
Every day, Ali Matheson takes to the waters of Loch Ness. We do have a monster in here, don't we? Just in case you'd somehow not heard this news before. Visitors from around the world join his tour to try to catch a glimpse of the so-called monster amongst the murky waters. But even Ali has struggled to find it. In the Exander, maybe three times in 10 years, I've seen big objects in the water, which have then vanished. So that would be my, my closest to, to, to a, a sighting of a monster here. And it's tales of the elusive creature that keeps the magic alive, even when you don't get to see it for yourself. In August of 2023, hundreds of hopeful volunteers joined a two-day hunt for Scotland's fabled Loch Ness Monster on Saturday and Sunday in what organizers described as the biggest search for Nessie in more than 50 years. Somewhere in these 7,452 million cubic meters of water, they believe Nessie hides. Despite failed mission after mission to prove the monster's existence, the biggest search for half a century is underway. 200 volunteers lining the banks of Loch Ness at 17 strategic points, drones with thermal imaging up above. I am taking part in the search. We have come all this way. I've been hunting Nessie for nine years. This will be my seventh tour on the loch, my first official hunt. Uh, I love, I love uh, the paranormal. I go on ghost tours, you know, I go track down Bigfoot, Loch Ness, I love all of it. So I'm here for the biggest uh, Loch Ness uh, hunting event in the last 50 years. Volunteers from around the world were allocated locations around the 23 mile long lake from which to monitor for any signs of Nessie, while others took to boats. A hydrophone was also used to detect acoustic signals under the water. Unfortunately, not enough proof was found to put the mystery to rest. You no, know, we heard some fantastic, bizarre sounds on Friday, which was incredible. I still don't know what that was. So on the Saturday and today, we went back over that area with the hydrophone on deep scan, we went back to the same area, we lowered the hydrophone again, and we did not hear those sounds. So I'll leave that up to you guys. We still don't know what that was. We will hopefully, in the future, uh, get to the bottom of that. It may well be gas escaping from the bottom of the lock. It could be an animal, or of course, it could be the elusive Loch Ness Monster. In my mind, there are only probably about 1% of photographs that I would give any credence to. The rest are just uh, anomalies, water reflections, you know, the standing wave, etc. It could be an otter diving into Loch Ness. There's so many things that could be misconstrued as a fanciful Nessie. And although I believe in Nessie with all my heart, I'm not naive enough to think there's other explanations to account for, for what's in Loch Ness. When it comes to Loch Ness, and the ever-persistent enigma surrounding its legendary resident, one fact is clear. The hunt for Nessie is far from over. From age-old legends to contemporary endeavors equipped with advanced technology, the quest for answers never stops. While skeptics may cast doubts on these stories, the unwavering fascination with the mysterious creature remains the same. As the loch's murky waters continue to cover their enigmas, the Loch Ness Monster search continues, ensuring that this legend remains captivating generations.